I, I, I knew we were going to get deep into it. I knew yeah. it. That's why I wore my sweater. to try to be as smart I'll as you. I'll send you a few mo of, of my Excel models after this, and you could tinker with it and make your own decisions after that. How did you know? That's exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Welcome to Teague Talks, the hospitality-centered podcast that dives deep into the stories of industry leaders to give you the very best in hotel market insights, investment, and inspiration. I'm your host, Teague Hunter. Today's guest, Michael Belisario, Director and Senior Research Analyst at Baird, joins us to discuss his Alice recap, public market M&A, and his hot stock tips for 2024. Hey, Michael. Uh, thanks for joining me again. Welcome, welcome to the Two Timers Club. By the way, this I is was going to ask you. I it. saw that in the notes. How, how many are in this club now? I, Just that's a, a few, great right? question. I should I should know that it's not a lot. This is a finite. This is an elite club right now for you. You asked me back because I think it was late May 2020. I think everything we talked about pretty much came true. Did World you nail fun. it? Should we, I mean, you know, it's it is out there in the sphere, so we could find it with real ease. Yeah. Check you if you were right or not. It works for me. That's that's the good thing about this business is that we we have opinions and we change our ratings. Very rarely do people actually go back and check to see if we were right or wrong. So nobody ever goes back. I love it. Great. Let's make some more stuff up today. What do you say? That's what I do half the time anyway. You're very good at your job. Very good. Thank uh, you. Uh, missed you, Alice. By the way, missed you. I'm assuming you were there. Yep, I I was there um, holding court. Um, Conference has gotten pretty big. I feel like we're, I'm tucked away in a meeting room most of the time, but uh, you're, you're not front row. Little, say I that again. You're like front row at the panel. Oh, well, I don't know about front row, but um, I rarely go to those panels. But I Man. found a lot more of the companies, the REITs and the brands, they go more of our investors are going. It's turned into an even bigger beginning of the year kickoff conference for the public companies, too, which is nice to see. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm very biased and I actually mean on the positive side. I, it's great for our industry. It's a great excuse to get everybody together. It kicks off the year. Let's go. What are you what are your plans for the year? What are you going to get done? Here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're going to get done. Uh and there's enthusiasm. Everybody's everybody wants to do deals. Yeah, and it's at, it's the beginning of the year. And I think for your business and a lot of businesses, flipping the calendar is sometimes half the battle. Uh, very well said. We took a little break for the holidays and now we come back. All right, so give me your you. Let's hear it. What's what's your brilliant takeaways from Alice? Share. I'll give you mine, but people want to hear yours. I think the biggest thing is the public markets have moved. Yeah. Not just hotels, everything in the last 60 to 90 days. But the underlying fundamentals, especially the top one, it's kind of the same. I think the best way to think about it is everyone's got a, a bear case or a downside scenario. They got their base case and they got an upside case. I don't think the base case necessarily change too much depending on hotels and customer segments two to four rev par growth maybe three to four three to five if you're a little bit more of an urban tilt higher expenses ebitda and a lot up a little margins down um that's sort of the same as what we would have talked about in november after third quarter earnings uh, but i think really what has changed is the de-risking and people de-emphasizing that recession scenario the the downside scenario just it doesn't appear to be materializing and more people are focusing in on that middle part of their underwriting which is plus or minus sort of the same and then the biggest change is the debt markets i always say credit makes the world go round and if you could price the debt you could price the equity and i think when we talked three and a half years ago it was really tough to price the debt which yeah. made it really really tough to price the equity it you see it firsthand. It's it, it's getting I don't want to say easier, but it's easier and easier to uh, to get debt and to price the debt, and that's certainly helping on the uh, sentiment side and the uh, sort of the equity valuation side of things. But um, sort of more of the same um, is kind of how I see it. All right, there's a ton to unpack there, though. I liked it, so we're going to talk about all of it. Your vision for the future, interest rates. Stocks. The, the stocks seem up, though. Sorry, the prices all seem very rich. I mean, certainly the stock market's at all-time highs. Does that concern you at all? Concerns mm -hmm. me. 
No, I, 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 I've been doing this for 14 and a half years now. And you know, we have a lot of hedge fund clients and they want to know, and like, why was the STR data week in San Francisco that we got yesterday? It's, I don't know. It rained. It snowed. There were flight cancellations. So I say, one, well, don't miss the forest through the trees. And the whole point of stocks, the reason they exist is to go up, right? The, the history tells you stocks go up eight to 10% per year and companies adapt. And I think what people missed broadly a year ago when it was recession, this recession, that yeah. is you just assume companies were going to run themselves into the ground and that's not what happens. Um, and then the public market is also just a big herd mentality. It's a, it's a, it's a voting machine. Uh, but no, not, not really. I mean, the, the hotel brands, uh, especially Marriott and Hilton, basically all time highs every day for the last however many weeks, the REITs are certainly not there. Um, it's a handful of stocks, but no, and it's the, the world is okay. And the biggest companies are the ones that are growing the fastest. So therefore, that's why the market's up. Um, let, all right, let's let's talk the brands real fast. I mean, because you mentioned their price, they're way high. Why? Why? So I think it, it's specific to, to Marriott and Hilton, and you see it a little bit with Hyatt. Investors, broadly, this is not just for hotel investors. They're paying out for growth, technology stocks, quality growth within every subsector, if you look. Uh, across different industries, the highest quality, some of the biggest, the one with the ones with the longest track records, those are the ones that have gotten bid up, and that is Marriott and Hilton. And I think specific to hotels, it started in September. Marriott's investor day, Hilton's got an investor day coming up in in March. Is there were concerns about about net unit growth, and Marriott talked about how it's going to get better. And then Hilton said on their conference call, five and a half to six net unit growth. And they said in the press release Monday, closer to six. And I think people have gotten more comfortable with the trajectory of that net unit growth, which is so important for them. And net unit growth is growing faster than RevPAR. Therefore, it should be valued more highly uh, by the public market investor. And you can layer that, right? You can see what's under construction two, three, four years out. And people pay up for that certainty. And the REITs don't have that. Choice and Wyndham have less of that. And that's why those stocks, aside from the, the hostile takeover attempts that uh, I know we'll get into, uh, people are paying up for quality. Short answer. And that's Hilton yeah. Marriott. Yeah, it's funny. We talked to uh, uh, on camera and off camera, but Tony Capuano, Marriott, right? Uh, Chris Nassetta and Danny Hughes, Hilton. And they said they're very, their pipelines are very full. Thank you. They're smiling ear to ear, right? Ear to ear. You could just see it. You could feel it. They're very excited, which is a little counterintuitive because I'm like, whoa, 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 I'm pretty sure the developers we're talking to are are not leaning in as heavily as they were. But at the same time, the trick, right, is they, they have more brands. They have the new ones they've announced and all those pipelines are as full as they've been. It's, so I, I always tell investors good to be it's, the about king. The, it's about the dots on the map and it's one plus one is greater than two. It's good for customers. It's good for owners. It's good for developers. Good for vendors. It's just this. It's really it's a really good flywheel. The thing that the public market, and we don't see the data, it's really hard, is what didn't get signed and started in 20 and 21, got signed and started in 22 and 23, and now it's starting to hit 24, 25, 26. So it's a timing and a, and a layering that we can't see very well, the companies can. And I think that's why they have so much confidence that the numbers are going to keep getting better. Not back to 2019 yet, but better than they've been the last couple of years. And it's certainly backward looking. It feels like a sort of trough net unit growth for them. All right. Let's talk about the reads, really the public reads. But uh, what, what do you see there with all those guys? Well, they're they're a little happier today than they were 90 yeah. days ago because yeah. uh, you know, they, uh, they live and die by their stock price. Um, I'll, I'll, let's look at 23 really quickly. Stocks were down, interest rates were up. The hotel REIT stocks actually did relatively okay. They were predominantly net sellers of hotels and they were buying their stock back. Yeah. I think when you look to 24, stock prices are up and maybe my answer changes if the stocks are up another 10, 15%. I think they'll sell less. They'll clearly buy back less stock because their stock prices are up and they all want to buy more. I'm not, I'm not convinced they're all going to be able to and it's it's obviously easier said than done, but you go on the list. It's host has got a lot of money, do dollars, and capacity to buy. Apple just bought a bunch. They want to buy more. Diamond Rock wants to buy. Sunstone's ready to buy. So 
I think from a capital allocation perspective, you'll see less selling and the hope for more buying. Um, and then fundamentally, they're all, aside from balance sheets, some are better than others. They have more urban, more group exposure than the average hotel. So they should, from a top line perspective, outperform the overall industry as you and I think about it. But costs of capital are still high. They all still think their stocks are cheap, less cheap than they were 90 days ago. And you know, I, I got to remind people, it's a cyclical business. It's CapEx intensive. As a public company, you got to pay out your cash flow as a dividend. So you got to be really good at, at timing the capital markets. And the capital markets have been all over the place for the last four years. So it's it's been tough for them. So uh, maybe we're going maybe to move to M&A, but... Um... It's funny, the stock prices, right? They were 90 days ago, they were 40% NAV, right? Yeah. Now they're, they're still 20% NAV. I don't know if that's standard for the REIT model or if that's just where they are. That, that, that's a challenge for the REITs. You, you did this analysis, you go back to 07, 10, 15, 20% of the time they trade at a material premium. It's at early points in the cycle when people pay up for the, the, the public securities versus the where the assets are trading. Right, like the stocks peaked in January, February, March of 21, a lot of them. Yep. Asset values didn't really peak until probably 12 months later because it takes some time for that to work its way through the the private market. Um it's just, you know, they, they live and die by their stock price and they all want to do deals, just just like the guys you work with. Some of them haven't done deals in a year or two. And there's incentives to grow and you can leverage the 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 platform. Um, and it, it's sort of been tough sledding for them. And I think you'll see them trying to be more active in 24. Yeah, you, you get it, Alice. You could feel that pent up energy. They all, Everyone wants to do deals, the public people, the private people, et cetera. So let's talk. Are, they, are the private equity people more incentivized to do deals, right? They got a ton of cash on the balance sheet and they, that's how they live. They've got to do deals. They, they can't sit for years. So what do you see with the private equity guys? I, I actually think you'll see it's those guys need debt. Debt is more widely available. CMBS is starting to pick up. Um, actually, Blackstone has two large non-hotel uh, CMBS deals in the market now. There's other hotel deals uh, in the pipeline. And, you know, deal one leads to deal two. Deal two gets priced off of deal one and so on and so forth. And there's kind of this momentum that builds. And I think if you see that with the debt market spreads coming in, base rates are clearly lower, or at least you can lock it in over five years. I think that will benefit the the private guys. There's just less deals that have negative leverage today than compared to six months ago. Um, I think all the REITs, they recognize, hey, we're unlevered buyers. Now's the time to lean in. Really, the only one that leaned in was Apple last year. They bought four or five hotels in the fall. A host didn't do anything. They, they have an investment grade balance sheet. I know they're frustrated. They want to buy stuff. Um, but as the debt market gets better, it brings in more competition for them too. So a little bit of the chicken and the egg is how, how long do they wait? And if pricing gets better, but the debt market also gets better, there's, there's more entrance looking at deals. So I'd expect private equity to be a little bit more active, but when, if you're asking on take private transactions and bigger deals, it, the math doesn't really pencil. You got to pay a big premium. There's a lot of transaction costs. Still kind of hard to get two billion dollars of debt today to take a kind of mid-sized REIT private. So um maybe that is a back half story if uh stock prices are lower and the debt market's better. But I, I, I see everyone being more active, but I think it will take some time as as the year progresses. I so I agree with that. My slight pushback is they're still trading 20% below NAV. So you can pay a premium. Uh, you know, the Blackstones and the big guys that work the still play the KSLs, which maybe let's talk about Hersha. You can still pay a premium and get a quote deal because you bought the assets at par and both sides win. Yeah. It, it, I guess it depends is what is your view of NAV versus the public markets? Yeah, um, yeah true. There's, uh, there's always the comment that, hey, I'm buying 30 assets. I really only want 20 of them. I have to take disposition risk, but I have to pay for the whole portfolio. Um, you know, Hershey was a little one-off where um, you know, they had the affiliated management company. They were a smaller portfolio. There was a lot of leverage. So the enterprise value went up a little bit, but the equity went up a bunch. 
Um, it'll be interesting what what uh, KSL does. I mean, I I would have thought they would have sold more hotels by now because there's a handful in there that trade on a price per pound kind of metric that uh, I would have thought they they might have sold, but but they haven't yet. So I think people point to that. Uh, but you go back and look since 07, it was strategic, Hersha, and then there were a bunch of other. Yeah, Four Point is not middle of the fairway. Um, you know, full service or select service, but there haven't been that many take private deals um, back to 07. Well, why not? Well, I, I, well, you have to have a willing seller, right? It, it, it takes two to tango. And I think that's a challenge too, is some of the guys that on the private side that can buy a REIT or might be interested in buying one, the company is not for sale. Do you really want to bang your head against the wall trying to get the board and the management team to sell? And then it becomes circular. If if I think if I'm a exec and I think my company's worth 10 and you offer 10, all of a sudden 10 is 1050 and then 1050 is 11, and then there's no transaction. But um, you know, there's also a lot of transaction costs, there's frictional costs too. And I think maybe this is a, a function of 06, 07 is you just go buy one or two big hotels on your own and you have your story and you can get half the capital deployed instead of buying. 30 hotels and making it a very public process that, that, that that's a reason too i assume yeah and oh by the way you're a comfortable executive at a at the reed and you don't really want to be out of a job so yeah you gotta there's, be a, some of that they get they get paid well to not work right um, right but yeah it's um it, it's tough it, it, it is an impediment to doing uh take privates for sure yeah it's why the Hersha deal got done because at the end of the day, it's the Shaw family. And they were like, yeah, we're out. Let's go. Yeah, And they owned a lot of stock. So they had a the, the payout they got from their ownership was disproportionately high versus the change of control they get versus how it's set up for some other companies, too. So you got to agree about those incentives as well. All right. Let's talk about let's keep going down this crazy M&A path. But uh, Choice Wyndham, that's an obvious elephant in the room. Discuss. The big, big elephant. Yeah, what it do you makes think happens there. I wish I knew. It, it's yeah, really up to the FTC at this point. You, um, both management team, right? One, they're not engaged. At least privately, they're not engaged, and they've sort of both hit the big red button and gone nuclear, and there's no turning back. Um, so they're both in tough spots because they've showed their hands. Um, it makes sense for them to combine, right? Bigger is better. We saw it with Marriott, Starwood. Uh, franchisees should certainly benefit. Tons of cost synergies. There should be revenue synergies. Choice is our top pick on the brand side. Hey. And I think where the stock's trading and where investors are at, it's sort of heads I win, tails I win, because stock is so cheap that if they don't do a deal, they can just buy back their own stock and they have their own growth strategy. And if they do do a deal, I will hear about it soon enough. And then they sort of, if the FTC approves it, Wyndham sort of, they have to engage and they have to negotiate. Maybe Choice has to pay a little bit more. And then in six, nine months time, we're going to be talking about synergies, upside, deleveraging, pro forma, pro forma numbers. And the public market is going to say, oh, wow, this is really cheap. And look at this upside. So I, I, I wish I could say yes or no. I think it's going to happen. I don't even know if it matters at this point because it really comes down to the FTC. And to me, from Choice's perspective, both outcomes are pretty good from a stock perspective. I'm going to put words in your mouth. If That's yes, a good non-answer, right? No, nah, it was great. You're brilliant. You're really good. You're really good at this. I actually liked it, though. And I, my, I'm i going to put words in your mouth. If the FTC approves it, then it happens. Oh, yeah. If they don't approve it, then it doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, in the... Yeah. The, the other thing is, too, this is a, an added wrinkle, is that let's say the FTC says no, and it's June 30th. Trump wins the election. There's a different uh, view in D.C. There's a different head of the FTC. Is there a second attempt maybe in 12 months' time? I know that's way down the road and probably a little far-fetched, and I don't think choice can hang around the hoop that long, but that's also a crazy far-fetched scenario that I don't, I don't think is a zero probability. No, I think you're right. Um, yeah, that was interesting. I hadn't even gone there. All right, so I'm gonna let's go there from a business perspective. What do you? See? It's an election year. What do you see? What are the risks? Headwinds, tailwinds. What are you pulling for? What do you see happening? What should we be looking out for? Well, I think I think the risks are lower because 
we were all surprised when Trump won in 2016. We collected, we know what we're getting now. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that de-risks it a little bit when you think about what, what's happening in November, what will happen in November. The public market's not really focused on the election. That always sort of flips in June, July, and it becomes, okay. you know, everyone's talk and focused. And yeah. then it fades the day after the election because business is business and it goes on and how much can the president really do? Um, I think the bigger thing is the sunsetting. No one's talking about this yet. At the end of 2025, the tax cuts that went in place for us, the self deduction, the, the the corporate tax code change that was permanent. But for the individuals, that that sunsets in less than than 24 months, and that could be a big change to what does or doesn't happen. You know, I'm in Chicago. What happens in the state of Illinois, New York, all the blue states that lost a bunch of people to to Florida and Texas and, and Arizona? I think that's the big thing to actually focus on because that 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 impacts. 300 plus million Americans. Do you think they come back? I guess it depends who's the president. Um, we got to fund the deficit spending somehow. Um, I, I I don't know, but it's the reason I bring it up is because no one's talking about it. Yeah, and at some great. point, people will be talking about it and it will become a risk. Um, but no, I, I think people like to talk about the election. It's great water cooler conversation. I don't know. Is your business really changed because of the election? Does ours? No. We're still going to travel. We're going to stay in hotels. We're going to go see our clients and our investors. It's it, it's a point in time where everyone sits at home and watches CNN for 48 hours. I mean, we listen, we obviously we all want a strong economy, right? And we and but we've all learned to work in all in again, we just keep saying, tell us the rules of the game, we can play in all matters. We going up, yeah. we going down. We had high inflation, low inflation, high interest rate, low and in, low interest rate. Would be like low inflation, low interest rate all the time. Of course, we had we had that for fifteen years. But okay, now we're going to play in a different world. And in the grand scheme of things, the election, the change there, very small relative to the change that every person and company had to endure 2020, 2021. So yeah, small right. potatoes. Yeah, and even then we got through that, didn't we? I mean. It was brutal we, don't we want did. to do it again but look you know you manage through it you do what you did and now you now you keep moving on yeah okay yeah i think that and then the other risk too is it's always out there it's the geopolitical what's going on in china what's going on in the middle east uh you know you're starting to see shipping costs go up does that lead to a little bit of inflation and price pressure to come back um and affect what the fed does yeah. on the margin i think that's important but you can never really predict that stuff, but that that's always out there. And it seems to be a little bit more you know, on a simmer right now, but but starting to bubble up. So it's something to keep an eye on. All right. I want to I'm going to get my pen. I want to let's let's talk stock market. I yeah. want to get your predictions. One for T Hunter's personal stock account. I hope you me took too. me up to three and a half years ago on all those preferred shares and all those yeah, discounts. You, you did nail that. I mean, you beyond nailed that. Yeah. No, yeah. I did not take you up on it. But here we go. Here's the pen. All right, this time, let's go. What, is the market going to be up or down this year? Obviously, you're calling up because you have to. You're up eight percent. Well, so I, the general S and P up or up or down this year? I, from here, I think we'll be up a little bit, but I don't. You're not going to have the same kind of returns you've had the last two years. A lot of the big move has been the re-rating of this you know, six rate cuts. Yeah, maybe that's where I differ from people. Is the economy is really good. And is the Fed really going to cut six times? If they do, it's because the economy is slowing. So in all of our models, we have three cuts this year and then two cuts next year. Starting so maybe there's, maybe there's some indigestion in the market when we don't get a cut in March and people start to recalibrate. But earnings are pretty good and the biggest companies are still growing. So you know, the, the, the trend is your friend, but I'm not, I'm not one to say we're going to have double digit returns from here because the big moves have already been made the last 30, 60 days. All right, so so wait, real clear point of clarification. When do you see the rate cuts starting? Second half? Yeah, middle of the year. Agreed. Same. And you're just calling three, second half of the year sometime. Yeah. yeah, and some of that is just everyone says the Fed's too restrictive. It's like, well, they've been really restrictive and employment's been good, GDP's been good, the economies have been good. Why do they need to give that back? Um, and we're all used to zero, so that doesn't... We don't have to go back to zero. 
Um, and you know, the public market always throws tantrums too. 2018, same thing. Oh, rates went from zero to two and people freaked out. Um, you know, what happens if we go from five and change to four and change, not three and change? Do people freak out a little bit? Or who knows? But yeah, th- three rate cuts. Some of that is because the economy is still good. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And they'll cut when the economy slows. I heard yeah. you say that and I agree. Okay, what am I? What stocks am I? What am I doing with my money? What stocks am I about? I I got choice written down. That's the top of the yeah. list. Choice is our top pick on the brand side of things. That's a 12, 24 plus month outlook. Both scenarios, I think you get really interesting returns as a as an equity holder. And on the REIT side, we like RLJ. Um, okay. you know, Why? Some urban tilt to their portfolio. Uh, clean balance sheet. They can buy back stock. They can buy assets. They don't need to sell hotels. Uh, they're doing these conversions that are starting to to finally lead to some earnings upside. To me, it's kind of a middle of the fairway. You're not paying a big price for it. And they're kind of walking the walk now when they had been talking about all these conversions and some of the upside. And you know, as Northern California and the Southern California exposure they have comes back, that should lead to some better growth. So the way I view it is it's sort of a lower risk name where you can get the same or better returns as some of the other hotel REIT names out there today. You're not paying a big price for it either. Do you think that, who do you think is the most active? Which REIT, sorry, I'm tra- jumping around. Which REIT do you think is the most active? Uh, in terms of percentage, obviously host might spend the most dollars. Um, I think Apple will remain active. Uh, some will remain active on the sell side. Um and then Sunstone, but there's an asterisk there because they made a big sale. They want to make a big buy. So they've, they've queued that up. I, I would say those three as sort of percentage of size are probably going to be some of the biggest. All right. I, I agree with those. Um, all right. What other, any pref equity crazy positions? I, was so to, I, hey, I had a feeling options, you were going to ask. What am I doing here? I, I looked them up. So they're all trading at like seven, mid seven ish current okay. coupons below par. For your PA, I think it's totally fine, right? There's, there's sort of, I think the preferreds are actually lower risk than what people think they are. Right? If things go south, these you were money hole in the GFC, even for the two companies that, that stopped paying them. You were money hole when they pulled back in 15, 18, COVID, um, and you're higher in the capital stack. And worst case scenario is the company issues equity, the prefs go up in the capital stack. So- um, you know, Summit has them, Diamond Rock has one, Pebbleberg has a couple. They're all kind of mid sevens. That's for a PA, that's pretty attractive. Put it in a Roth, don't pay tax on it. And I think the best thing too is you're you're below par. So you're not you have a little bit of margin of safety where maybe you can get a dollar or two if rates come in further and you get a little, you know, five, ten extra percent on the uh on the capital appreciation side. But um, you know. They're all sort of priced the same. So go with the one who's got the lower levered balance sheet for plus or minus the same return. Well said. Yeah, listen, I'm writing this down. You you were you were spot on last time we did this. Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is great. Um, love your insights. Um, sorry I missed you, Dallas, but I will see you at Hunter. I'll see you at the conference. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. You're the best. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it.